You are now listening to Vigilantes Radio, presented by the only one media group. This is the people's choice for quality interviews, celebrities, and special guests. Hosted by Demetrius Dinny Reynolds. Call in to join the mix at 701-801-9813. For the complete archive of episodes, visit onlyonemediagroup.com and be sure to like us on Facebook at Vigilantes Radio. We welcome all. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Demetrius Houdini Black Reynolds. Enjoy the show. Hello, hello. What is going on, guys? Welcome to another incredible episode of Vigilantes Radio Live, right here on iHeart Radio. And I am your host, Dini. I do have to say this particular episode is pre-recorded, uh, but I can't wait to deliver it uh, to your inboxes. And for you guys who subscribe to the show, you'll be the first to know. Before I bring my guest on, I do want to say, you know, life. Okay, Dini, what's right about it? Well, think for a few moments about all the things that are right in your life. Or rather than complaining so much about the problems and difficulties, spend some time appreciating all those things for which you can be thankful. And whatever you focus attention upon, it will grow and become influential. So focus that attention on the good and valuable and positive aspects of your life. You know, rather than defining yourself and coloring your perspective based on what's going wrong in your life, think in terms of what's going right. Instead of keeping your thoughts buried in your limitations, allow those thoughts to soar into your best possibilities. Instead of worrying about the worst that could happen, put your your attention and your efforts into creating the best that is possible the place where your attention is most often focused is the place you are surely moving towards so again just focus your attention as much as you can on the best you can imagine and keep looking in that direction keep heading in that direction and you'll most certainly get there take that from me coach Dini. that is my word let's go Access, a minority-run nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting survivors of domestic violence and sexual abuse. Our prevention division educates the public on healthy relationships, consent, and boundaries, while our recovery division provides support and resources after trauma. We offer workshops and coaching to individuals worldwide, helping them navigate complex issues and reclaim their power. We believe in the power of education and conversation. Our interdisciplinary approach challenges societal norms and empowers individuals to live authentically and purposefully. With the guidance of our accredited coaches, you can overcome obstacles, achieve your goals, and create the future you desire. Don't wait to take control of your life and your sexuality. Visit our website, SexSorg, to learn more about our services and how you can get involved. All right, all right. Again, welcome to the show. You are listening to VRL. That's Vigilantes Radio Live right here on iHeart Radio. And I'm your host, Dini. Our interviews are designed to go beyond the music, news, books, art, acting, films, technology, education, entrepreneurship, entertainment, and sometimes even past that thing that we call the ego. Our interviews are designed to go behind the scenes and into the minds of these incredible human beings. You know, the ones who are out there giving it their all for me, for you, and for the world. I want to welcome you guys to today's special episode featuring two remarkable talents in the film industry, Giovanni Esperutu and Daryl Barnes. Giovanni is a multifaceted filmmaker with the history of impactful storytelling and Daryl is a seasoned director and writer from Dublin bringing their collective vision to the intriguing series called Sisters of the Desert and today they will share insights into creating a series that blends the mystical with the real exploring powerful things through the lens of you know a women's group so get ready to peel back the layers of this mystical narrative and discover how these creators turn complex themes into compelling screen stories and with that let's welcome them to the show daryl giovanni hello and welcome 
this is actually Giovanni. <laughs> I'm not sure where Daryl is on on the on the uh, podcast right now, but he should be in Hi. here. I just talked to him. Oh yay, there he is. Hi. Uh, hi, Jeannie. How you doing? Thanks for having us today. I'm doing good. Doing good. It's wonderful to have you both here. Um, I guess we should start, uh, you know, with a uh, deep question. Uh, in your careers, both of you guys, um, you've both tackled things that require some deep understanding and often a personal connection. Uh, but also in this world of ours, what do you truly believe is worth fighting for? Daryl, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, well, I think, um, I think um, uh, today, really, uh, in coming from a place of art, uh, particularly with the type of work that Giovanni and I are, and, and uh, my film company are trying to do, we're definitely trying to get back to the, the, the type of filmmaking that was done similar in the 70s that uh, had more symbolism and subtext and uh, that the acting was the special effects and that the audience would basically feel a connection uh, with, this, with the everyday story sizes of life that people go through every day. Um, so we've become very passionate about uh, projects that, that deal with that and that people are, are able to, uh, to connect with. And in the world of, of Marvel and DC, which I, I do love as a, as a comic book nerd, but obviously sometimes, um, <clears throat> sometimes uh, that can kind of get further away from kind of the truth that we're, we're kind of going for. And, and, and that's kind of what we're kind of passionate about at the moment is the truth. For me, um, all of my storytelling comes from a place of like where I'm trying to figure out myself and like the deep healing that is necessary to, you know, to learn about myself in the world. And I think Sisters of the Deserts definitely come from that place, um, Daryl approached me a couple of years ago because he knew that I had a background being in a cult and there's a lot of like power dynamics within that and a lot of questioning about faith and spirituality that was happening for me during that time and I kind of wanted to take those themes and put it into something a little bit more fictionalized but still having like the emotional truth there. Um, so that's what you know that that is what I'm willing to fight for within storytelling is like fighting for what is the truth of the matter and people have you know truth truth people have different versions of the truth um and it depends on like what what perspective that you're looking at things from yeah 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 so I, I... I read your story, Giovanni, and I was like, hmm, Sisters of the Desert. I wonder how close to this is she really, you know, personally. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 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 my personal background in a cult was in a biblical doomsday cult. Sisters of the Desert has a bit of the doomsday in it, but it's far enough removed from my personal story that I can, like, treat it like a story and like work through some of the things that that i went through through a fictionalized version you know what i mean if that makes sense yeah. um because it's a little bit too hard for me to you know a little bit too traumatic for me to like go into like my own personal story um so that's why like art it is a way for me to tackle those different transformations and those different questions that i had in a way that feels safe yeah. And that's why Daryl's there too, because he's he's a WGA writer. He has so much like um, you know experience in the industry that he helps navigate that all too, and gives me like a safe place to kind of like filter all that stuff through. Yeah. So you said Doomsday. Is that like a group that's preparing for the end times or like a survivalist? Uh, kind of like in my in my own personal story, yeah, in my own personal history, it was a biblical doomsday cult. We believed in the second coming of Jesus, and there was all this like stuff that was going to happen uh, before the second coming. And I was in the mountains learning survival skills, and some of that is going to definitely come out in Sisters of the Desert. <laughs> you know, some of some of like the the life and death stuff, um, not yeah. necessarily the biblical stuff, but yeah, the life and death stuff for sure. Oh, do. And that was that was definitely something that we we talked about at the beginning of the genesis of the uh, of the concept, um, because um, how uh, initially when I approached Giovanni, I was researching multiple projects, uh, or, or sorry, multiple cults to potentially do a project um, on cults, and I uh, researched and met people from the Heaven's Gate cult. Oh wow. Uh, 
research people um, from the uh, Jim Jones cult, and um, I did an awful lot of research because a lot of a lot of uh, networks at the time were doing documentaries on cults, and there were TV shows, so there was definitely an interest. And then there was one book that a friend of mine got me to read. Uh, which was about the Desert Fathers, the sayings of the early Christian monks, which was kind of uh, 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 pretty much the way that celibacy was brought into the Catholic Church. And I was raised, initially raised Roman Catholic in Ireland. Um, so I grew up with all of that, and I was going to uh, potentially uh, do the project about the Desert Fathers who went off into a desert uh, to basically create the, the, the Catholic Church that we, that we have today uh, through the celibacy. And then I had a dream one night about these women out in the desert wearing kind of white clothing and kind of meditating so uh, it went from being the desert fathers to the sisters of the desert and I thought that would be more of an interesting dynamic to have a women's cult in the desert uh, coming from more of a sci-fi background set against Native American uh, uh, mysticism. Absolutely. I didn't realize there were any survivors from Heaven's Gate or uh, Jim Jones' clan. Um, yeah, no, there are um, there are there, there are a plethora of, of people that left uh, before the suicide. Ah, uh. seven or is it 98? I, I'm 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 forgetting the specific year, but there were there were, uh, there are a number of members that actually I think it was about seven or eight of them, um, possibly even more uh, that left and just decided to move on and have regular lives and get married and have kids. And mm. before the suicide happened. So um, a, around 2018, uh, while I was uh, living in New York at the time, um, I reached out to one of them who, who happened to live in New York, and I met up with him, and he gave me quite a, quite a fascinating insight um, into the Heaven's Gate cult. But unfortunately, that kind of demystified um, uh, the, the, the whole cult in itself to me because you know, a lot of people when they watch you know cult movies or TV shows or documentaries they, they do it for an element of, of you know kind of giving them a bit of um, kind of a, a jolt almost like watching a horror movie mm -hmm. um, that kind of left with the fact when you get to know the people and understand it to a certain degree so that's when I, I decided you know what I think I'm going to create an original piece um, about you know women uh, about a women specific women's cult dealing with specific issues onto themselves, um, and then when Gian, uh, Giovanni and I started talking, uh, and I was I kind of developed the idea to a certain extent. That's when I approached her and I said, "Hey, you were in a cult, and, and I'm writing something about a cult. So why don't we put our heads together and possibly come up with either a film or a TV show?" Initially, we were thinking film, but then we kind of worked our way back around to being a TV show, just because we wanted to go into the specific detail of these women's lives, uh, and we just felt it would be better expressed uh, in a TV format as opposed to film. Absolutely. Out of all of the cults that you researched, which um, intrigued you the most? Oh, that's a good question, because there's, there's, there were so many. Um, I think I would still probably, even though it was uh, demystified for me, I still would probably go back to the Heaven's Gate cult, um, only because... You know, comparing all the other ones that I that I looked into, um, I really felt probably out of all the ones because a, a, a lot of the cults and I'm you know I, I'm generalizing them at the moment, but a lot of the cults that I that I reached out to, uh, and this is a part of one of the ideas that we we, we talked about uh, for the TV show. When you got to the end of a lot of the other cults, it really was about either money or sex or some sort of violence. It was, uh, as I kind of say it to Giovanni, it's kind of the, the Wizard of Oz effect. You go behind the curtain, it's just some person. It's not really a wizard. Uh, and that's what I kind of really felt with all the other cults except Heaven's Gate because their convictions, they really believed wholeheartedly in, in Doe, uh, Marshall Applewhite, who was the, the, the leader of the cult, um, that he was influencing them and taking them to a better place, and they had disciplined their lives almost as if they were, they were on board a ship at sea or in space, and they would work together in unison to, you know, create uh, this life together and they were very loyal to each other um, they focused very much on working with each other which they believed 
that they were bettering themselves. And I guess, and I know maybe a lot of the families that you know that have unfortunately lost a lot of them due to the to, to the uh, to the suicide may not feel that particular way. But um, there was a certain sense, maybe sincerity is not greatly the best word to use, but um, because it was it was obviously terrible what happened. But um, I felt kind of as close to being, you know, pure in their form. I felt Heaven's Gate was the one that, that really fascinated me, and that was really kind of the closest one that I felt a, a greater understanding with. Yeah. Giovanni, can you discuss how your personal experiences influenced the development of the uh, series characters, particularly the leads? Well, it's, it's interesting because I have the lived experience of actually falling for, you know, the cult life. And I was at a place in my life where I was very um, discombobulated. A lot of things were happening in, in my life that where I was like searching for a family. And the lead in our, our series has gone through all kinds of crazy, like trauma. And that's when... Um, she is recruited into the cult because she's looking for something outside of herself because she has so much chaos. And so that's kind of like how, you know, I have a very internal experiential knowledge of the emo emotional journey of these women because I've been kind of like very, very close to, uh, you know, like the leaders of the cult. Like I was like a good student, you know? So like when, when Daryl and I were discussing the journeys of the different characters, we, we definitely, you know, like, like, um, you know, we, 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 we knew who these people were, you know what I mean? Like I, I yeah. knew like the, the, the exact types of these people. Yeah. And, you know, with 2024, you can almost tell any story that you want to tell. Um, Daryl, you mentioned that there was a certain movie magic in the 70s. What has changed? Um, well, I think a lot of the material um, that, that is out there is not exactly the greatest. Um, um, you know, and I think this began to start to kind of surface around the mid to late 90s. You would hear a lot of actors um, like Robert De Niro or Al Pacino or Deborah Winger, and they uh, they were basically talking about that the the, the material that they were getting uh, wasn't particularly great. So I think that's when the decline started happening, and then that's when technology started to take over in the early two, um, in the early twenty uh, first century when we started switching from film to digital. And that's when I think there was more of a focus on uh, how much content that we can produce faster because we have digital as opposed to shooting things on film, which can appear to pe uh, people sometimes that it's slower, um, but really, um, <clears throat> you know, film in regards of quality and longevity is, uh, uh, to me anyway, is a thousand times better. So I think really um, that... Uh, was really a game changer uh, when we started to have film, films like 28 Days Later, which they're now getting ready to do a part three of with Danny Boyle. Um, that kind of, that was one of the early films, and I think along with Collateral, a Michael Mann film, when they were really starting to switch to, to digital uh, uh, format and that they could produce more films in less time, like that movie Phone Booth. Uh, uh, that Colin Farrell made with Joel, uh, Joel uh, Schumacher, and they shot it in seven days. Um, and um, I'm not saying that any of those filmmakers specifically out of hand, but the, the industry was changing to bring out um, content faster, quicker, and maybe with a little bit of less thought, and that, that's when CGI was beginning to overtake a lot of films, um, and that definitely caused a lot of you know, content problem and quality problem, that we were going more for special effects than for the quality of the projects and the storytelling. I, I think that's the main thing, is that the, the stories um, are, are not really original anymore. Uh, and that's definitely something that Giovanni and I are trying to work on, and, and, mm -hmm. and also um, my, uh, that my film company, CFI Films, with my, with my uh, business partner, actress, uh, and producer, Alicia Blazengame, 
uh, we're, we're trying to get back to the, the, the type of storytelling that affects people, that connects with people, and also, you know, when, when the actors on screen feel, then we, the audience, feel. Um, so I think that's what we're missing kind of today in, in, in filmmaking. I get that. You know, the bulk of the budget is spent on the effects, and the writers come last, it seems. Yeah, the, the writers come last, the, the actors in a lot of ways come last, um, you know, um, I, I don't think a lot of actors are, are really getting the time to be allowed to experience on set and really kind of go there because, you know, there's this mentality, we can just shoot it really quickly and then move on to the next. That's all very well and good, and we understand budget restraints can do that if you, only, if you have no money or if you have only a certain amount of money that will dictate to how long you have, and, you know, we totally understand understand that as independent filmmakers, but um, what those movies did between 1968 and 1982, the, what I refer to as the golden age of cinema, um, it, it, it really, you know, it really allowed the actors to inhabit the roles, and the great thing about those, about the movies in the 70s, it just felt like it was happening right in front of you, like it was real, like it was really happening in front of you. And we kind of had, we kind of got it back again. I, I kind of feel that the 90s were kind of the 70s part two, mm -hmm. because we had wonderful films made in, you know, made in the 90s. We had a lot of Spike Lee movies. Uh, we had Pedro, uh, Pedro Moldovar. Um, you know, we, we uh, you know, it just kind of bloomed from the 70s um, to all around the world, like with Bergman and, and, and so on. Um, but unfortunately, uh, technology kind of got away, got in the way of the storytelling. Yeah. So this question is for both of you guys. Uh, who produces the best movies, Marvel or DC? <laughs> I'll let you answer that one first. <laughs> So like like I enjoy things at face value and I'm such like not a Marvel versus DC like <laughs> like person right. you know so I'm just like uh I I'm a bit like now that James Gunn is kind of taking over DC if that's right right like James Gunn is kind of like I'm excited yeah. to see what that's gonna be like um but I am I'm I I'm very I like my superhero movies so I don't want to get in trouble with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm excited for for uh, to see what James Gunn does with the with the DC universe. Um, yeah. But yeah, I do like I do like my my um, Deadpool, and uh, I'm excited for Deadpool and Wolverine. And yeah. I don't want to get into any trouble with any with either of the studios. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I'm a huge, um, you know, I'm a huge Batman fan, so I'm looking forward to the next Robert Patterson, uh, you know, uh, Batman film, because the one he did was 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 pretty good, and I'm looking yeah. forward to the new uh, season of Daredevil, which they're going to have the Punisher back in it with uh, Charlie Cox. And, really, you know, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, John Bernthal is going to return to the Punisher, and apparently. Nice. They're, they're picking up from because uh, Netflix had the original seasons on it a number of yeah. years ago, and they had that whole thing with you know with Marvel with the copyright. So mm -hmm. apparently they're they're going back to from what I re uh, from what I read, and as you know these things change all the time what they release. But apparently they're they're going to go back to um, to uh, have a continuation of 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 those uh, of, of that series from what they did on Netflix. So I'm I'm really looking forward to that. I thought that was a really great show, Daredevil, Punisher. Oh yeah. Jessica, Jessica Jones. Yes, Luke Cage, all of that. Arrow, Flash. Okay, so for movies, I'm a Marvel guy, but for the television series, DC all the way. Gotham was like next level for me. Yeah, no, Gotham was great. Gotham was yeah. really great. And they had such really great, really great actors in it as yeah. well. Was it Donald, uh, what was his name? Donald Rogue, is that his name? I'm not sure. Yeah. He was in Blade, which is another great uh, film with Wesley Snipes. Yeah. Um, mm. uh, the Marvel, so, I think, we'll try to uh, bring that back as well. Yeah. So, Giovanni, um, there is an ancient uh, magical element to Sisters of the Desert. So, in this uh, in this series, how much research and practice went into like the uh, ancient magical elements? Did you have to light seven candles, walk backwards, and kiss a cat? You know what? Um, for this series, that that's actually um, Daryl brought in the really great sci-fi. Ah. Uh, so that was, but we we 
we hopefully we'll still go be able to go and get a uh, blessing because Daryl did a lot of research with um, uh, several uh, Native American and I'm not sure if that's the right terminology uh, communities at the Anasazi I think but he's the one to ask about that because he does his research and he does amazing research I love the magical elements because I love sci-fi and I'm like super woo woo and I love aliens so okay. I was super excited about that but the research stuff Daryl's Daryl's your guy to ask about that yeah I mean I'm I love sci-fi stuff too and I love a bit of woo-woo too as well and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring in uh, the uh, Indian element and I basically called upon a friend of mine who is an archaeologist and also a liaison with Indians um, <clears throat> and the federal government Colin Rimbo and um, he basically uh, helped me with the research with one of the tribes that we're going to have um, in the TV show, which is the Hopi tribe, uh, which came up from South America and uh, came into uh, New Mexico and Arizona setting up mesas, which basically a lot of people believe that they were trying to communicate uh, with um, you know, that basically communicating, you know, with the heavens, and there's a lot of indication to potentially say that they were creating, uh, communicating potentially with something that was extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was that was a really kind of fascinating element. And initially, going back to what I said earlier, when Giovanni and I were, were you know really full speed ahead working on the TV show, we didn't want it to be just you know Wizard of Oz, which is obviously a great film, but you pull the curtain down and it's just something over money or or whatever. Um, that's why they're bringing people into the cult. No, we wanted to have it that it. Uh, that these people go on this kind of sci-fi experience and transformation that they're going to a different dimension and that there is an element of of, uh, of aliens within the story and that's mm -hmm. definitely what we wanted to, to go for uh, with this because both Gina, Giovanni and I are, are really big into sci-fi and uh, we wanted to go down that road. Where was the series filmed? Uh, well, we we haven't we haven't actually shot it yet. We just did a proof. Ah. Of, we just did a proof of concept last week, mm -hmm. and um, I actually I have my producer attached, Frank Capra the Third, who's the grandson of Frank Capra, who who did It's a Wonderful Life, the Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and um, we are in the process of um, uh, speaking to a couple of networks uh, about um, taking the project on. Uh, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with one of them, and we're hoping to have another one in May. And so far, we're getting a pretty positive response. And uh, if things do go forward, we're going to hopefully film in Arizona. Yep. Nice. Okay, a magical place. Yes. Yeah, but it's... <laughs> But, but we, we really wanted to focus this being um, very much uh, very much about a show because um, it's an all women's show. It's about a women a women's cult in the desert, and we really wanted to have this specific piece about women communicating with each other and working on the everyday issues individually as a person on themselves and with each other. So that's what we're really excited about. Absolutely. Well, I pray that everything goes great uh, with getting this uh, thing off the ground and approved by the uh, production companies. Are there any plans to expand the series beyond the uh, initial release? I mean, that would be uh, great. <laughs> yeah, we, actually, we, we actually, another another element that we designed with the, TV, with the TV show is that we also created a feature film called Morbid Blood because I got inspired by the TV show The X-Files. Um, mm. I don't know if you watched The X-Files in the 90s. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which was a wonderful show. And um, The X-Files had a spinoff called Millennium which had Lance Henriksen, which actually Giovanni did a film with. Lance Henriksen yep. was Aliens, and he played Bishop. Uh, and he's been in a plethora of other movies. Um, so what they did was, in Millennium, instead of it being supernatural, they had it more with uh, psychology and more with mediums. And um, But they kept within the X-Files world. They didn't really have aliens. It was more to do with um, with psychology. So we came up with another show, uh, with another with a feature film that's set within the same world of Sisters of the Desert called Morbid Blood. 
uh, and that basically takes place near an Indian reservation in California, and it, it basically deals with um, a sect um, that is basically robbing people's dreams. Wow. So we're wanting to we're wanting to expand it. Uh, one element going into um, a movie, and then keep the Sisters of the Desert a TV show. So what we'd like to what we'd like to do is is, is have it as a kind of a three to four season uh, TV show, uh, with maybe having uh, you know creating a universe around it and having more of a blood in it. Mm -hmm. Nice. So Giovanni, you have an upcoming feature film, Love and Karma. I could tell already it's a little different from Sisters of the Desert, um, <laughs> but what themes and messages um, are you exploring through this project? Um, well, Love and Karma is in post-production. I also have uh, another TV series that was greenlit called Made to Shine. Those are both rom-coms, and they star Filipino and Filipinx leads um, in that. Uh, the themes that I... And the themes that I that are like very pre prevalent in all of my work are women's issues, you know. Um, they uh, both of uh, Love and Karma stars a you know an older Filipino woman that's looking for love, and she goes back to the Philippines to her uh, grade school reunion and then reconnects with her childhood love, and they go on this whirlwind romance, and it's inspired by a true story. It's not all true, but it's inspired by a true story. And then Made to Shine is about a Filipina um, who is a maid, and she is, it's also a rom-com. She meets, like, this Filipino pop star, and they have, like, a romance thing. And that deals with a lot of class issues. So it's, like, women, class issues, you know, people of color are things that, all of my work kind of has and same thing with sisters of the desert it's going to be uh women's stories and like the interplay and the power dynamics um with that so i'm you know like it's it's because i'm a woman it's pervasive in all of my work you know? <laughs> absolutely you have to get it in there you know yeah, I can only I can only talk about what I know, you know, and what I know intimately from an emotional standpoint is like all of the drama and all of the issues that we have to deal with as women, as women of color in a world that's not necessarily designed for us. So maybe we need to create our own world or like, you know, try to find a world that welcomes us. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. The crazy thing about it is that it's 2024 and we're still dealing with those issues. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why we yeah. need the show. Yes, absolutely, and that's and that's something that we're we're very much you know wanting to do is is to be able to obviously create you know uh, a particular this particular project, the Sisters of the Desert, that it's it's hugely diverse, and um, you know the forefront is about uh, these issues that these women women are dealing with on an individual level, specific mm -hmm. with the subtext. Yeah. So, Daryl, um, as AI technology like Sora becomes prevalent in the film industry, what are your thoughts on its use in screenwriting and production? Do you see AI as a tool or as a threat to traditional filmmaking? Well, uh, growing up heavily in the 80s watching uh, Terminator and then in the early 90s watching Terminator 2, um, I can definitely say that there are some warning signs that we have to heed from it. Um, you know, that giving, giving fully, um, you know, the, I, I, have a, I have a couple of friends that are working on developing particular software packages similar to Final Draft that are kind of giving you like a, a writer's room uh, element with AI. I can see some of the elements to be very productive. Um, but I think I would definitely err on the side with Stephen Hawkins that we should use caution in, in how we develop it. Um, I, I, I definitely think that it shouldn't be kind of used uh, with actors with, with, with kind of duplicating uh, kind of faces and people's performances. Um, you know, that's obviously would take away from an actor's job from being able to do that. So I, I, I think that has to be curtailed. Um, but uh, we're, we're such in an early, I mean, AI has been around for a long time. Um, obviously, the, the developers have, have had certain aspects of it developed for, for quite a while, and it's just only becoming mainstream the past couple of years. But I, I do feel we have to use caution with it because um, going back to what we were talking about, films of the 70s, 
you know, there was there was no real technology except the film camera, and we were able to tell perfect stories back then. So I I think for certain things that we uh, for our everyday lives, I think AI is is beneficial to a degree because we we have it with our you know when we when we you know when we call like a, a bank or anything like that or if we we call into a particular office where we're getting a voice on the phone and we're not we're not speaking to a human being so it is a little bit scary that we're taking the human element out of our lives um so i i really feel that we have to proceed uh with caution absolutely we do um, what are each of your favorite scenes or elements uh, in Sisters of the Desert and why? I'm going to say, yeah, like, I, I, I'm I, looking forward to the ecstatic dance scenes and the initiation scenes just because um, that was a key, like, element of, like, <laughs> of like, like, what, like, solidified my you know my own you know loyalty to you know the, the things that I've joined beforehand so I'm excited to see how that plays out on screen and excited to see the, not only the the camaraderie but also like how deep they go with their devotion mm -hmm. yeah oh maybe um, yeah Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was just thinking about the wolves. Like, yeah, the wolves. I, I'm yeah. excited about that, too. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to two things. I'm looking forward to the personal relationships that the women have, uh, get to have and that, that get to really connect with each other. Um, I don't think we get to see that that much. Um, but I think, in a way, it's not just about representing just only women, but it's representing all of us um, you know, in the world. It's, it's definitely a metaphor about how we you know, communicate and speak with each other. And then I think after that, I'm, I'm also really excited about seeing Indian representation in the US uh, being more at the forefront and um, having this particular, there, there's so many tribes uh, throughout the U.S., uh, there were there were so many for us to to kind of pick for, but I'm 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 really excited about exploring more of the myth mythology with the the Hopi tribe that has such a vast vast history and culture, and um, I'm I'm really excited about uh, some of the, the the sequences that we've incorporated into the to the scripts uh, to showcase and highlight that because um, there is such a rich uh, history and cult uh, Indian culture in this country and um, today everything's about representation and I think this is one area of representation that we uh, we definitely need to see and I think it's uh, I think it will be very exciting and uh, and uh, I, I'm really looking forward to, to to sharing that with everyone I think it's going to be really exciting absolutely Giovanni how did you escape your cult um, you know, it, it was a series of many escapes. Like, you know, I, I do a lot of work in domestic violence awareness because that was also part of my history. And they say it takes a woman at least seven times to leave her abusive partner. Well, it took even longer to leave a mindset and to leave a whole community. So it was like a series of, like, awakenings, I would say. Um, part of, you know... If there were so many like weird elements to it you know how daryl was saying like you know like uh in in like in like a lot of cults it leads to like the money and just like one person um this was kind of weird because like the the particular doomsday cult that i was involved with was like a series of home churches so we weren't there wasn't like a centralized like person at the top but in these little small home church communities there would be a person and i ended up in one i started in the philippines i ended up in one uh living in yosemite because we all had to live in the mountains because jesus was coming soon and um you know the the two uh leaders of that one was a husband and wife team and it started out really great it started out like everybody was like kumbaya and stuff um and then then just like weird stuff would happen and it would get more and more like controlling and more and more getting in trouble about stuff and 
Uh, we, uh, the person that they married me to, we left that over something. I don't even remember what it was, but it was something crazy and harrowing. And we just took off. And then extracting myself from that abusive relationship was a little bit, you know, it took more time. So, but the, the last straw was um, I have a kid from that, you know, experience. And when there was abuse happening with my child, uh, I had to, I knew that I had to leave because for me, like I could take it. Like I felt like I was strong enough. I was, I would do this for the Lord. But um, when I saw that it was affecting my child, that was like, this is not right. So, it, you know, like that was a long winded question, but I mean, winded, winded answer to the question, but it was a series of steps away from that. And then it took years to like deprogram my mind from that mindset. And I'm still doing that today. Absolutely. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think hearing that will kind of also help, you know, put me in a mind frame when I do get a chance to watch and absorb um, Sisters of the Desert, just hearing your story. Yeah, like, oh, sorry, you right there. Oh, no, I was just going to say that, like, it is the emotional truth of these women that I represent. Daryl's great with the, with the research and with, like, you know, the, um, all that stuff. But, like, I, that's my big thing is, like, what was it like to be a cult member? What was it like to be in the presence of, you know, these leaders? You know, that's what I bring to it. So, yeah, hopefully when you see it, you will see, see the heart of it all. Oh, and Daryl, go for it. And some, and some of the things that, you know, Giovanni was, was touching on that, you know, um, things that became, you know, uh, you know, harmful to her kid. I mean, some of the, um, the cults that, you know, that I researched and people that I spoke to, um, that was, that was one of the elements that made them want to leave is because they were asking them to do things that would basically harm or affect their future. <clears throat> and then also in, in the fact of doing that with harm others, being, being uh, one of the things being able to have children and, um, you know, be able to have a potential family life if one wanted to leave uh, uh, the cult. Um, so I think these are some of the elements that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're going to try and incorporate uh, into the TV show um, about, you know, the mind control and the, um, <clears throat> you know, basically how people are making choices and, and what's affecting their choices and, and, and how they're being manipulated into making those choices, which is, you know, which is quite scary. Um, mm -hmm you know, what Giovanni experienced and, and also what some of the other people that I interviewed and, and spoke to about is, is that it was it was basically taking away natural parts of themselves to, to live a full and, and rich life over somebody um, having these particular thoughts and control over you, um, which was kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, but we all kind of when we're when we're looking at these movies or TV shows or documentaries and we all and, and some of them are about cults, we all go, oh well, I would have seen through that. I would have, you know, um, I you know I would have been able, I would have got out of there and left. But it's it's not as easy, particularly uh, with something recently like Nexium where with uh, with Keith Raniere. Um, a lot of people were very subtly brainwashed, bit by bit, day by day. Um, and it was just everyday, everyday stuff that would be said to them that would make them believe what they were, what they had to do in life to become a better person. And um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's really sad and it's really terrible that you know when people leave these cults, they have to spend the rest of the, the rest of the time uh, with their own lives picking up the pieces of of what they've been left with. Um, to try and put their minds back together and, and realize that they're whole again. Yep. Absolutely. All right, guys, where can our listeners connect with you online and uh, keep up to date with news about Sisters of the Desert? Um, you can go to our, um, sorry, uh, the company's website, uh, cfifilms.com. Um, where we have um, um, go into the section uh, that has about our work, who we are and our work and um, uh, there's sections on Sisters of the Desert and some of the other projects that we have going as well 
Yep, and uh, you can find me on GiovanniEspiritu.com, G-I-O-V-A-N-N-I-E-E-S-P-I-R-I-T-U, or uh, Instagram at Geo Spirit, and then the number two. Um, yeah, but thank you for having us on today, and thank you to the people that are listening to this as well. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for having us today, it was it was a real pleasure to talk with you, and it was it was also really great uh, for everyone uh, to listen about the projects that we're doing, what we feel passionate about, and uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And there, I forgot to ask: um, Is Dangerous Days still in pre-production? Yeah. Yes, we are in we are in pre-production over that. Um, nice. We, we basically, um, I, as you know, last year um, um, a, a lot of things came to a grinding halt because of the the strike, mm-hmm. um, the multiple strikes that uh, that were in the industry last year. Um, so we are just basically uh, working on a casting issue that's basically just delaying us at the moment. And uh, but we're we're working with uh, a casting director. And I'm also working with my producer. Uh, Frank Capra the third and also Alicia Blasen game and we're, we're basically just filling that um, filling that role and as soon as that's sorted out we're hoping to be in production for July and August nice Frank Capra the third is also producing sisters of the desert is that correct yeah, yeah that's correct oh. yeah Frank awesome a producer on all my projects and he's uh, part of the company so we're we're really really happy to have him and excited to be working with him awesome giovanni and duro thank you both for joining us today and sharing such fascinating insights into the making of sisters of the desert you guys passion for storytelling challenges entertains and enlightens um, is truly inspiring and to our listeners make sure to catch Sisters of the Desert and experience, experience the magic and mystery Giovanni and Daryl have woven into every episode make sure you guys follow their journeys I will include the links in, this, in the uh, description of this episode and in the show notes so all you guys have to do is just click the links thank you guys so much have a good night thank you Danny. thank you so much Hey, what's up, long time? I forgot to mention that, oh, by the way, this is Deanie, you know, Vigilantes Radio Live, uh, VP of Operations for Busy Bone from Bone Thugs and Harmony, blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, Only One Theory dropped a new single. It is called La Hefecita. It's on Spotify. As a matter of fact, it's on all major platforms. You should check it out right now. Oh, and by the way, there's also a visual on YouTube. It's hot. Check it out today. Only one theory.com. Check that out too. Peace. Thank you, my Vigilantes family, as always, for checking out my podcast over here at Vigilantes Radio Live. All episodes are available for free download, and you can grab it from either Spricker.com forward slash only one media group, Spotify, CastBox, iHeart's Radio, iTunes, YouTube, the app Podcast Addict, or over at our website which again is only one media group.com and that goes for every single show that we've ever aired if you like to request some music or send something for me to play email it to v radio at only one media group.com that is v as in victor and here's my disclaimer we are genre free we do not judge and we absolutely do not base our opinions on hearsay but facts alone and actually scratch all of that because all of my opinions are always right that's the bottom line this is my show so deal with it (laughs) just kidding on behalf of myself denny i appreciate all you guys for tuning in either afterwards or live with us spread the word because sharing is caring we stepped up our game just for you guys and our guests to make sure that you have the best experience here on our show be sure to connect with me on facebook twitter instagram tumblr snapchat tiktok and all social media sites as well as spreaker youtube we always follow back okay well just remember to put yourself into everything that you do and never stop investing in yourself peace love grilled cheese and talk with you later
You are now listening to Vigilantes Radio, the people's choice for quality interviews, art, music, and hot topics. Hosted by Demetrius Houdini Black Reynolds of the duo No Longer the Hero. All episodes of this podcast are available for free download at www.onlyonemediagroup.com. This is a seventh sign regime, Rebirth Worldwide Syndicate exclusive. What's up, guys? It's Dini, and I want to welcome you on a journey of the heart and of the mind. These Fucking Feelings podcast is a beacon in the world of mental health advocacy, and it invites you to join a conversation that's changing lives. We are here to share, listen, and grow together. Led by the passionate Micah Bravery, alongside the insightful Rebecca and Crystal, This award-winning podcast dives deep into the human experience from navigating relationships to coping with loss. No topic is off limits. It's about real stories and real emotions. These fucking feelings is more than just a show. It's a community, a place where vulnerable isn't just accepted. It's celebrated. You can find it across major platforms, including YouTube and Facebook Watch. This podcast is a touchstone for anyone seeking understanding and support. These fucking feelings podcast where every emotion is valid and every story matters. Tune in and transform the way you see mental health.